Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Podcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. Before we get started, I wanted to make sure you knew that inside the Canon app, Douglas Wilson has a full course on biblical finances. Make sure to start 2021 off the right way with your finances. Get it today in the Canon app. You can download it from the app store of your choice and subscribe. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 179, 179. Can you believe that you've been with me 179 times? Well, that is if you did what you ought to have done and started with me on number one. You may have jumped in in 169 and then, you know, you don't get a lot of credit for that. But here we are, episode 179 of the podcast. It's um, good to be with you. Whatever time you're giving up for this episode, thanks. So I want to talk a little bit about a practical problem that a lot of uh, any Christian who works for a corporation that has an HR department, a practical problem that everyone has, they're at, at least at the level where they're having to think about it, think about it beforehand. And it may be something that's where decrees have already come down in your corporation. And I'm talking about the vexed problem of pronouns. We've gotten to a pretty silly level where people get to choose their own preferred pronouns, and then everybody else has to uh, use those pronouns. And if you don't, if you resist, if you, uh, then you can be harassed or fired or castigated as a, a thought criminal, uh, you know, a hateful, spiteful person, because you won't use the, the preferred pronouns that this uh, the person is demanding that you use. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm one step back from this. I'm not only am I not going to use these pronouns for people, but I'm, I'm refusing to even learn what they are. I've not committed to memory any one of those weird pronouns that I, I think um, that I've seen floating by. I'm not going to learn what they are. I don't know. I don't care who refers to what cis, per, you know, I'm just not going to pay attention. Now, or you could, cr- Christians could use, like I recently tweeted, one all purpose pronoun for people who are demanding that we use pronouns. And that, that all-purpose pronoun would be what, uh, W-U-T, what said this. So, isn't this simply, uh, some Christians might say, why are you drawing the line here? Why are you uh, dying on that hill? Why are you willing to risk being dismissal or encourage Christians to risk dismissal over something like a pronoun? If someone wants you to refer to them uh, by a particular pronoun, why, why don't you just uh, accommodate them? Isn't it a, a matter of simple courtesy? No, it's not a matter of simple courtesy at all. And here's, here's why. Obviously, we have to live in the world that's disintegrating all around us. We have to live there, and we have to accommodate to a certain measure, to a certain extent, what the nonbelievers are doing. The Apostle Paul, when he tells us not to associate with a brother who is living immorally. He says uh, in Corinthians, I did not mean non-believers. I didn't mean children of this world who are living immorally, because then Paul says, then you would have to go out of the world. So, it is a false assumption that Christians have that they are somehow contaminated by functioning in the world or doing business with people who are living sinfully and whatnot. And someone might say, well, isn't isn't this an example of that? No, um, this is the difference. When I'm, wor- let's say I'm working alongside someone at, in a big corporation who's transitioning, and he, he, tells, um, he tells everybody in the department that these are his preferred pronouns. Now, when he refers to himself using these pronouns, when he refers to himself, my Christian faith doesn't require me to go over and punch him because he's sinning. He's sinning, and I can let him sin. I, I, don't have to, I don't have to go to war with him. I don't have to attack him. I don't have to shoot him. I don't have to, you know, I can simply let him be that way. But what's happening here is the demand for pronoun usage is where he is demanding that I become complicit in what he's doing. So, 
let's it, it, before all this pronoun crazy could i work could i as a christian work in an office where one of the guys was constantly bragging about uh the prostitutes he has been seeing okay yeah right he's a pagan he's living like a pagan i don't have to lash out at him because he's living sinfully because paul says you know, then you'd have to go out of the world. You're not contaminated by someone sitting there next to you, okay? But what happens if this guy who's bragging about the prostitutes he's sleeping with is comes to me and says, and now I demand that you applaud the last one I was with, Tiffany, as a noble character. I want you to say that she is a noble queen. Well, now it's not just a matter of his, his immorality. He's trying to get me to, in some measure, applaud what he's doing. And that's what I can't do. So here's the issue. If, um, let's say this guy next to me is transitioning and Henry is uh, now wants, to, he changes his name legally to Heather. He's getting uh, hormone treatments. He's doing the whole deal. And he is um, going to have surgery. Well, let's say he's had surgery. He's a man. He's had surgery. And he says, and I want you to use these pronouns, and my new name is Heather, not Henry. Okay, now I will call him Heather because that is his legal name now, right? He, my name is Heather. And you might say, well, it's an odd name for a man. Yeah, sure. Boy named Sue. This, the odd, odd things can happen. But his name is Heather. And when I say, there's Heather over there, I'm not lying. But when I acquiesce and say that he is a she, now I'm lying. He's not a she. He never will be a she. He can be a mutilated he, but he's not a she. You can't, so the, the issue is when we get to the pronouns, we are not talking about someone's personal name. We are talking about the world. Right? This, th there's a distinction here. The personal name, a person can go by whatever they want to go by. They can change their name to Sue. Okay, okay, Sue, uh, <laughs> I would say, you're a good man, Sue. Uh, so pro the pronouns are a battle over the world. They're a battle over uh, reality. They're a battle over the dictionary and control of the dictionary. A person's proper name is not in that same category. It's an indication of their problems, but it is not the heart of the problem itself. So, we are um, continuing with podcast episode 179, and we have, um, we've come to our homartiology section. And it's an odd one this time. Our, our word in this study is gog. Gog. So, properly speaking, this is the name of a tribe, of a people, and it's not the name of a sin, uh, at least etymologically, at least not in its origin, but it becomes the name of a sin. In the usage of Scripture, it became identified over time with the enemies of the people of God, and you'll see shortly how that happened. In the Old Testament, Magog was the grandson of Noah through Japheth, and later Gog becomes associated with him, presumably because Gog is a son or grandson of Magog. So, Magog is the grandson of Noah through Japheth, and later on Gog becomes associated with him. We start with Magog, and later on we get to Gog and Magog together. You see that in, um, you see this progression in Genesis, starting at Genesis 10 two, the sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshech and Tiras. So Javan, for example, is the father of the Greek, uh, of the Greeks. Magog is a, one of the sons of Japheth. And then in Ezekiel 38 two, uh, it says, son of man, set thy face against Gog the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So, um, other sons of, of Japheth were Tubal and Meshech, and Gog and Magog become dom are still associated with them. So, there's a tribal grouping that is descended from Japheth, and Meshech, Tubal, and, and Magog cluster together, apparently, and then Gog is descended from Magog in some level, and that whole grouping is called Gog and Magog. Now, in Ezekiel, 
set thy face against Gog, the, the land of Magog, there's a, there is a, a, a showdown there in the Old Testament. When we get to the one usage of the word Gog in the New Testament, we see how it is used to describe the enemies of the people of God. And that's in Revelation 20, verse 8. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So, in Ezekiel, Gog and Magog are representative of particular enemies of God's people in a particular part of the world. Gog and Magog are used that way here. Here in Revelation 20, notice it's going out to deceive the nations, and it's all the nations uh, in the four quarters of the earth, everybody everywhere, all the unbelieving nations, all the... uh, all the rebels, all the people rebelling against God's, Christ's millennial uh, reign there in Revelation 20. And all of them together are called Gog and Magog. So, and, and notice the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Gog and Magog is enormously powerful. They are mighty. They are powerful. They are overwhelming. And they are defeated. So we continue on with um, podcast episode 179. Uh, Thanks for joining us. Uh, The book review, uh, my book review this time, is a book called The Starfish and the Spider uh, by Brofman. And I think there's another author too. Uh, The Starfish and the Spider. And uh, this was quite an interesting uh, book. This this book falls in the category, I I don't know if you'd call it a business book or um, anybody, anybody who's responsible for Uh, the leadership of various organizations, whether it's military or business or educational or whatever. And uh, he has a, this is quite an interesting uh, thesis and uh, the center of which I think is uh, self-evidently true, the starfish and the spider. So the, here's the analogy. This is how the analogy works. If you cut a couple of legs off a spider the spider is likely to die. Uh, If you cut the head off a spider, the spider will die. But you've got, if if you take a starfish, which has got all these appendages uh, sticking out, if you cut off one of those appendages, you are going to have two starfish. The two pieces will, (laughs) will grow into two starfish. If you cut a starfish in half, it will grow into two starfish. You can't really cut off the head of a starfish because it doesn't have a head, and it has in each in in the different appendages it has the wherewithal to continue functioning. So that's the basic analogy. Uh, the spider standing for a spider organization, according to uh, uh, this book, a spider organization is a command and control organization, a top down, you know, a, a company with a CEO and a very defined flowchart. And the people at the top are in authority, and decisions are made there and implemented downward through the chain. Okay. A starfish organization would be a highly decentralized organization where there is no head, there is no CEO. There's a common culture or a common set of commitments, a common um, set of marching orders. But no, no one person is in charge. Okay. Now he uses different illustrations uh, to to talk about this, and he has a an amusing story of um, someone who is trying to get investors in the early days of the internet. Someone is uh, out there trying to get investors. I think it was in Paris, France, and he was having trouble answering the question from these prospective investors. Well, who's the president of the internet? Who's the president of the internet? And he was trying to say, well, it doesn't have a president. Well, and, there, and of course, that was nonsensical to them because how can you have this big thing, this big opportunity that doesn't have someone in charge of it? Now, uh, since that time, we've had no shortage of people who have wanted to become the president of the internet, but that's a separate challenge. That's a, that's a separate issue. So, this, another illustration he uses for a starfish organization is Alcoholics Anonymous. So AA is uh, highly decentralized. Anybody who wants to start an AA chapter can just do it. 
and you don't they don't you don't have to get permission you don't have to you, you just here's the here's the stuff and this is what we do he tells the story of how um cortez basically conquers the aztecs aztecs they had this huge civilization and a handful of spaniards come in and conquer the whole thing and they conquer it in short order and he argues that it's because it was a centralized command and control type of civilization. And then he describes how the Spaniards made their way up uh, north and until they encountered the Apache. And he describes how the Apache were uh, an enemy that the Spaniards were never able to conquer. And he points out that the Apache were highly decentralized. They had a common culture, but they were decentralized. Now, this is there, there are places where I think um, they should have uh, made room for, you know, pushback. Uh, yeah, but, you know, where the Aztecs had mountains of gold, which gave the Spaniards the motivation to conquer them. Um, and the Apache were decentralized, scattered, you know, over a desolate area. And when they were attacked, they, they moved from their primitive dwellings to a nomadic type of dwelling and thus were harder to conquer. Well, there were not humanly speaking, on a carnal basis, there were not the incentives to conquer either. But that said, the point is taken that organizations that are monolithic and huge and have top-down are vulnerable in ways that decentralized organizations are not. Okay, Now, decentralized organizations can suffer mission drift, I think, more, more quickly, more readily, but it's not like the big ones are immune uh, from mission drift either. So I enjoyed this book. It was, uh, it was interesting, thought-provoking. If you are a pastor, if you are, uh, it, uh, another thing I should say, in this book, they talk about organizations that are um, uh, fusion organizations where they, uh, they have, they're a spider company, but they have large elements of starfish about them. And this, ha and this um, uh, can be seen basically in who has the authority to make decisions. In this, uh, with a reference to another book, many years ago, I read a book called MIG, MIG Pilot, and it was about a Russian pilot who defected to the West with um, a MIG jet. And it's, it discusses his um, introduction to the culture of the West, his first visit to a Western grocery store, for example. Uh, but one of the things that really astonished him was he was given the privilege of visiting an American aircraft carrier. And uh, the thing that flummoxed him was how much decision-making authority and responsibility a young 19-year-old sailor had in launching aircraft. So uh, the Navy is obviously, a, uh, the American Navy is obviously a command and control organization, but a lot of decision-making authority is pushed down throughout the ranks. So that would be an example of a starfish and spider combined. Anyway, the, the, um, if you have any kind of organizational responsibilities, the book is worthwhile. Mm -hmm.